Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, a book by Joseph Schumpeter, 1942. Chapter 7, The Process of Creative Destruction. The theories of monopolistic and oligopolistic competition and their popular variants may in two ways be made to serve the view that capitalist reality is unfavorable to maximum performance in production. One may hold that it always has been so and that all along output has been expanding in spite of the secular sabotage perpetu uh, perpetrated by the managing bourgeoisie. Advocates of this proposition would have to produce evidence to the effect that the observed rate of increase can be accounted for by a sequence of favorable circumstances unconnected with the mechanism of private enterprise and strong enough to overcome the latter's resistance. This is precisely the question which we shall discuss in chapter 9. However, those who espouse these, uh, this variant at least avoid the trouble about historical fact that the advocates of the alternative proposition have to face. This avers that capitalist reality once tended to favor maximum productive performance or at all events productive performance so considerable as to constitute a major element in any serious appraisal of the system but that the latter uh, the later spread of monopolist structures killing competition has by now reversed that tendency first this involves the creation of an entirely imaginary golden age of perfect competition that at some time somehow metamorphosed itself into the monopolistic age, whereas it is quite clear that perfect competition has at no time been more of a reality than it is at present. Secondly, it is necessary to point out that the rate of increase in output did not it decrease from the 90s from which, I suppose, the prevalence of the largest size concerns, at least in manufacturing industry, would have to be dated, that there is nothing in the behavior of the time series of total output to suggest a break in trend. And most important of all, that the modern standard of life of the masses evolved during the period of relatively unfettered big business. If we list the items that enter the modern workman's budget and from 1899 on observe the course of their price, not in terms of money, but in terms of the hours of labor that will buy them, i.e. each year's money price, prices divided by each year's hourly wage rates, we cannot fail to be struck by the rate of the advance, which, considering the spectacular improvement in qualities, seems to have been greater and not smaller than it ever was before. If we economists were given less to wishful thinking and more to the observation of facts, doubts would immediately arise as to the realistic virtues of a theory that would have led us to expect a very different result. <clears throat> Nor is this all. As soon as we go into details and inquire into the individual items in which progress was most conspicuous, the trail leads not to the doors of those firms that work under conditions of comparatively free competition, but precisely to the doors of the large concerns, which, as in the case of agricultural machinery, also account for 
much of the progress in the competitive sector and the shocking conspicuous suspicion dawns upon us that big business may have had more to do with creating that standard of life than with keeping it down. The conclusions alluded to at the end of the preceding chapter are in fact almost completely false, yet they follow from the observations and theorems that are almost completely true. But economists and popular writers have once more run away with some fragra fragments of reality they happen to grasp. These fragments themselves were mostly seen correctly. Their formal properties were mostly developed correctly. But no conclusions about capitalist reality as a whole follow from such fragmentary analyses. If we draw them, nevertheless, we can be right only by accident. That has been done. And the lucky accident did not happen. The essential point to grasp is that in dealing with capitalism, we are dealing with an evolutionary process. It may seem strange that anyone can fail to see so obvious a fact with, moreover, was long ago emphasized by Karl Marx. Yet, that fragmentary analysis, which yields the bulk of our propositions about the functioning of modern capitalism, persistently neglects it. Let us restate the point and see how it bears upon our problem. Capitalism, then, is by nature a form of method of economic change, and not only never is, but never can be stationary. And this evolutionary character of the capitalist process is not merely due to the fact that economic life goes on in a social and natural environment, which changes and by its change alters the data of economic action. This fact is important and these changes, wars, revolutions, and so on, often con condition industrial change but they are not its prime movers. Nor is this evolutionary character due to a quasi-automatic increase in population and capital or to the vagaries of monetary systems of which exactly the same thing holds true. The fundamental impulse that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion comes from the new consumer's goods the new methods of production or transportation, the new markets, the new forms of industrial organization that capitalist enterprise creates. As we have seen in the preceding chapter, the content, contents of the laborer's budget, say from 1760 to 1940, did not simply grow on unchanging lines, but they underwent a process of qualitative change. Similarly, the history of the productive apparatus of a typical farm, from the beginning of the rationalization of crop ro rotation, plowing and fattening to the mechanized thing of today, linking up with elevators and railroads, is a history of revolution. So is the history of the pro productive apparatus of the iron and steel industry from the charcoal furnace to our own type of furnace, or the history of the apparatus of power production from the overshot water wheel to the modern power plant, or the history of transportation from the mail coach to the airplane, the, open up, the opening up of new markets, foreign or domestic, and the organizational development from the craft shop and the factory to such concerns as U.S. steel illustrate the same process of industrial mutation. If I may use that biological term that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, the incessantly creating a new one, 
the process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. It is what capitalism consists in and what every capitalist concern has got to live in. This fact bears upon our problem in two ways. First, since we are dealing with a process whose every element takes considerable time in real revealing its true v features and ultimate effects, there is no point in appraising the performance of that process ex visu of a given point of time. We must judge its performance over time. As it unfolds through decades or centuries, a system, any system, economic or other, that at every given point of time fully utilizes its possibilities to the best advantage may yet in the long run be inferior to a system that does so at no given point of time. Because the latter's failure to do so may be a condition for, for the level or speed of long-run performance. Second, since we are dealing with an organic process, analysis of what happens in any particular part of it, say in an individual concern or industry, may indeed clarify details of mechanism but is con inconclusive beyond that. Every piece of business strategy acquires its true significance only against the background of its of that process and within the situation created by it it must be seen in its role in the perennial gain a gale of creative destruction it cannot be understood irrespective of it or in fact on the hypothesis that there is a perennial lull. But economists who ex visu of a point of time look for example at the behavior of an oligopolist industry, an industry which consists of a few big firms and observe the well-known mo moves and counter moves within it that seem to aim at nothing but high prices and restrictions of output are making precisely that hypothesis. They accept the data of the uh, momentary situation as if there were no past or future to it and think that they have understood what there is to understand if they interpret the behavior of those firms by means of the principle of maximizing profits with reference to those data. Using uh, the, the usual theorist's paper and the usual government commission's report practically never try to see that behavior. On the other, uh, on the one hand, as a result of a piece of past history and on the other hand, as an attempt to deal with a situation that is sure to change presently, as an attempt by those firms to keep on their feet, on ground that is slipping away from under them. In other words, the problem that is usually being visualized is how capitalism administers existing structures, whereas the relevant problem is how it creates and destroys them. As long as this is not recognized, the investigator does a meaningless job. As soon as it is recognized, his outlook on capitalist practice and its social results changes considerably. The first thing to go is the traditional conception of the modus operandi of competition. Economists are at long last emerging from the stage in which price competition was all they saw. As soon as quality competition and sales effort are admitted into the sacred precincts of, the th of theory, the price variable is ousted from its dominant position. However, it is still competition within a rigid pattern of 
invariant conditions, methods of production, and from uh, and forms of industrial organization in particular that practically monopolizes attention. But in capitalist reality, as distinguished from its textbook picture, it is not that kind of competition which counts, but the competition from the new commodity, the new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization, the largest scale unit of control, for instance, competition which commands a decisive cost or quality advantage and which strikes out at strikes not at the margin of the profits and the outputs of the existing firms, but at their foundations and their very lives. This kind of competition is as much more effective than the other as a bombardment is in comparison with forcing a door, and so much more important that it becomes a matter of comparative indifference, whether competition in the ordinary sense functions more or less promptly. The powerful lever that in the long run expands output and brings down prices is in any case made of other stuff. It is hardly necessary to point out that competition of the kind we now have in mind acts not only when it when in being, but also when it is merely an ever-present threat. It disciplines before it attacks. The businessman feels himself to be in a competitive situation, even if he is alone in his field, or if, though not alone, he holds a position such that investigating government experts fail to see any effective competition between him and any other firms in the same or neighboring or neighboring field and in consequence conclude that his talk under examination about his competitive sorrows is all uh, make believe in many cases though not in all this is in the long run in force behavior very similar to the perfectly competitive pattern. Many theorists take the opposite view, which is best conveyed by an example. Let us assume that there is a certain number of retailers in the neighborhood who try to improve their relative position by service and atmosphere but avoid price competition and stick as to methods to the local tradition, a picture of stagnating routine, as others drift into the trade that quasi-equilibrium is indeed upset, but in a manner that does not be benefit their customers. The economic space around each of the shops have been having been narrowed, their owners will no longer be able to make a living and they will try to mend the case by raising prices in tacit agreement. This will further reduce their sales and so, by successive pyramiding, a situation will evolve in which increasing potentially of potential supply will be attended by increasing instead of decreasing prices and by decreasing instead of increasing sales. Such cases do occur and it is right and proper to work them out. But as the practical instance usually given show, they are fringe and the cases to be found mainly in the sector farthest removed from all that is most characteristic of capitalist activity. Moreover, they are transient by nature. In the case of retail trade, the competition that matters arise not from additional shops of the same type, but from the department store, the chain store, the mail order house and the supermarket, which are bound to destroy those pyramids sooner or later. 
Now, a theoretical consideration which neglects this essential element of the case neglects all that is most typical capitalist about it, even if correct in logic as well as in fact. It is like Hamlet without the Danish prince. Thanks for listening.